Denis Villeneuve's Dune series is based on the book by Frank Herbert of the same name. It's about a neo-feudal society that has regressed away from automation after a war against machines in the distant past. Human-powered computation is now a necessary component for every aspect of life, including most importantly for this space opera, faster than light travel. A substance known as a spice gives the spacing yield almost machine-like navigator temporal foresight so they can do the calculation necessary to make faster than light travel work, and it can only be found in the desert world of Arrakis. Dune involves the royal houses of this feudal society as they attempt to risk control of Arrakis from its lethal environment, the native population and each other. Our main protagonist is Paul Atreides, whose family is assigned stewardship of Arrakis by the Emperor, only for most of them to be betrayed and executed by Arconians. By the end of the first film, Paul Atreides and his mother, Lady Jessica Atreides, are forced into hiding in the desert amongst the native freemen. Upon initially watching Dune Part 2, one could be forgiven for thinking this is a modern Lawrence of Arabia, where a white colonizer masters native people's way and then organizes them against their oppressors better than they can referred to sometimes as the mighty whitey trope. This is what uh, some have criticized the original Dune book for, as Noah Berlitsky wrote in The Escapist in 2019 about uh, the David Lynch's film in the original book, more broadly, and I quote, In Dune, as in other mighty whitey stories, there is a bit more going on. Paul's whiteness makes him an object of worship for the freemen, but uh, his time with them also gives him access to his full prophetic abilities, ultimately allowing him to defeat the Emperor and become the effective ruler of the universe. Paul's divinity and power comes from his ability to capitalize on the resources and pains of others. But uh, on the surface, mighty whitey characters are superior because of their whiteness. But dig a little deeper and their powers are borrowed or more accurately stolen. They are godlike because they have uh, appropriated the labors and wealth of others. Paul claims to be wrecked with guilt because he sees future in which he leads the freemen in a path of uh, bloody destruction across the universe, but really the guilt is for his present glory, built on blood and deceit that the story won't and can't quite acknowledge. And yet, uh, director Denis Villeneuve's retelling doesn't take that direction. At least, not totally. Dune Part 2 isn't a decolonization story at all despite what the initial first half of the film and its freedom fighting antics might suggest. It's not even really a colonizer wish fulfillment fantasy, but a film about how colonizer use ideology to conquer people. This fact is shown most prominently by a mystical prophecy the Atreides family has used, specifically Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, and the forces she represent to indoctrinate the native freemen. Jessica is a member of Bene Gesserit, a pseudo-religious order of all women who have the power to manipulate people with their voices. Bene Gesserits are the closest this series gets to a true villain. For a long time they have been planting the idea amongst the freemen that a stranger who fits the description of Paul will come to lead them as their mythical Mahdi, the freemen savior or the lesson I'll give, the one who will save the Arrakis. Multiple characters state over and over again that uh, this prophecy is a fabrication being used to control the freemen. As one character says, You want to control people? You tell them a messiah will come. Then they'll wait for centuries. Religion has been one of the primary tools of colonization. We don't even have to stray from our own world to understand this fact. It's a sentiment familiar to anyone who has studied Christianity and Islam, whose histories are intertwined with imperial powers, as spreading this religion to others as a method of control. From the Arab conquest in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Ottoman expansion into Europe and Balkans, to the Mughal Empire in India, we see instances where the spread of Islam was used to justify military conquest and establish political dominance. Likewise, Christianity's recent history is also ripe with example of imperial power using religion for control from the role of Christian missionaries in uprising in the Kingdom of Hawaii and the United States used to strip native people of their culture and language. Local religious practices were often demonized as uh, paganism or idolatry under both religions, fueling tension and conflict. While conversion could lead to cultural exchange and integration, it could also be used as a 
tool for exploitation of resources and subjugation of conquered populations. As written in the scholar's blog on Christianity's role in African colonization, essentially Christianity was a guise by which Western government justified the exploitation and conquest of African nation, denouncing the religious practices of Africans as witchcraft and heathenism. European nations sought to convert and then exploit the indigenous people of Africa. The use of religion in Dune is prelude to conquest, and it's a bloodless conquest at that. The Bene Gesserits have refined their violence, moving away from swords and other direct weapons that they leave to the realm of men, and focusing instead on the spoken words. Their voice, magically enhanced by spice, and consequently stolen from the people of Arrakis, has been weaponized to control the actions of anyone they chose. Resistors don't need to be killed by the Bene Gesserits. They merely need to be commanded to worship. As Chani is forced by the power of Jessica's wife to give Paul Atreides her tears to fulfill some arcane prophecy. Yet it's not just force alone that makes such indoctrination so insidious. Colonizers cannot be everywhere all the time unless you choose to let a version of them inside your mind. And that requires a far more subtle touch of persuasion and charity. There is a very telling line halfway through Dune Part 2 where Lady Jessica, who has now become Reverend Mother for Freeman, telegraphs to the viewers how she will sway the less dogmatic North. And it has everything to do with pinpointing vulnerable people in Freeman society. She says, We must convert the non-believers one by one. We need to start with the weaker ones. The vulnerable ones. The ones who fear us. Converting vulnerable population is one of the first things a rising group will do when it tries to gain power, and religion almost always plays a part in this. If we are being cynical, it's the reason why Christianity and Islam has so many orphanages and hospitals. We can see this in the historical development of Islam. Early Muslim communities, particularly under the leadership of Khalifa Hazrat Umar, were known for establishing social welfare programs. These programs provided shelter, food, education to the poor, orphan widows and the elderly. While this undoubtedly helped those in need, it also served to solidify the legitimacy of the nascent Islamic State. It fostered a sense of community and garnered support from those most vulnerable. Paul Atreides feels conflicted by his mother's machinations. For most of the film, he does not want to go to the more religious south because he feels he will be swept up in the messianic image that she has cultivated for him. The women in the north are depicted as being more egalitarian than the feudalism of his world and he wants to hang on to that image. Paul sees clearly that the entire mythology built around him is a lie. He knows the mystical powers that he possesses are not divine, but a predictive power combining genetic engineering and his spice's unique temporal properties. Yet uh, this truth does not matter, even when it's said out loud by him, when he tells a group of dogmatic freemen led by Stilgar that he is neither a messiah nor entrusted in ruling them. That makes them believe he is humble and even more worthy of his role. Unlike past mighty white text, it is the indoctrination around Paul, not anything unique about Paul himself, that makes him such a force to be reckoned with. However, these are the forces that Paul has not much control over as insurgency in the north ends catastrophically when his hit and run tactics push out Arconian to launch a strike against Freeman's strongholds, killing thousands and forcing the entire population to migrate to the safer, more extremist south. The one outcome he wanted the least. He may be a mythologized head of this messianic movement, but he isn't a god. He is not able to control the tides of history any more than anyone else can. He can merely ride them out. In truth, the only thing he can decide in the film is whether to embrace the role of a colonizer or let another noble take his place. Paul is oblivious to this fact, but we as the viewers know that the Bene Gesserits have been training another royal, Fayad Rota, a member of House Arconian, to take on Paul's role if he does not succeed in the coming to power. They are always playing games within games and have no problem leaning on the Arconians, the previous stewards of Arrakis, who almost succeeded in exterminating House Atreides, as long as they can be controlled. It should be noted that Tarconians are a hyperviolent imperial power. They are also subtextually coded as white supremacists, maybe, or maybe I'm just overanalyzing it. 
There is one scene in the massive stadium where at the center Fad Rota is killing people for his birthday and the viewer is treated to mobs of enraptured white people cheering on this man's brutality. Fad Rota is depicted as being the pinnacle of his people's white supremacist rage. He does not just kill men and women in anger, he carves them up to consume, giving the parts he does not want to his cannibalistic harem. For Bene Gesserit, there is no difference between Fed Rotha and Paul Atreides, and as the film progresses, we start to understand why. While Fed Rotha ruling the empire would be truly awful, we come to understand that Paul will be no different. He start to bend under his messianic role, coercing the free men into following him into battle and embracing his newly discovered Arconian roots to better take control of imperial throne. We must be Arconians, he tells his mother coldly. In seconds, any sympathy built up for him is erased. Ultimately, he pushes the pre-men into a holy war across the galaxy, distorting their somewhat egalitarian culture into a theocracy that gives them freedom from oppressors as long as they are willing to be tools for this white colonizer's bid for power. There is no good outcome in Dune, either in part 1 or part 2. It is deeply cynical text in which Paul Atreides realizes that in order to win, he has to fight fire with fire and out-colonize the colonizers. He declares himself emperor, taking the war of all against all on Arrakis and thrusting it onto the galaxy. If there is one major criticism of these films, it's not that they are white saviorists' texts. This latest outing is a thorough rejection of that perspective, but uh, that they are texts that do not see away past colonization. It is the air Paul Atreides breathes and its dominance is seen as inevitable. Even if its players shift ever so slightly. The freemen were occupied and now under the order of a new white overlord. They shall occupy the galaxy. But the Bene Gesserit's and even the dominance of the royal intrigue will not change. Dene Villeneuve has indicated that he is interested in continuing the story and based on this film's success, he most likely will get the chance. The temptation of a spectacle might push him to embrace the very mighty white trope he rejected, but maybe he will continue to toe the line and reconstruct empire again. Perhaps we might even get a glimpse beyond it. Only the spice can tell us for sure.